there's also artists who have a story and they're going to constantly be inspired by that story for the rest of their life. Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I geek out about the stories we're passionate about in all different genres, styles, and formats. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and I started this podcast during the summer of 2020 at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. As I watched the reaction of my friends, family, and social media circle, I noticed that many people turn to stories for comfort and help in making sense of the craziness going on around them. My goal was to do the same for my listeners, but as I chatted with my guests throughout the first year, I discovered that their personal stories were the most fascinating thing about each episode. Neil Gaiman says, Fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. I now know that sharing our experiences with others helps us defeat our own dragons. It is our stories that connect us to one another. Let's see what wisdom today's guest has to share with us. Today, I'm talking to Lala Drona, and this is episode 42. And Lala, I am so interested to know about your personal story, but also how did you move to France? Because I was looking at your podcast uh, information, and it said you were born in Colorado or something. And I said, how did you end up in France? Yeah. So yeah, I was born in Colorado. Um, I grew up in in Denver. So I I lived there up until I was around um, 20 years old. I started traveling at that point um, Mm -hmm. in college. And so I I first traveled and I studied abroad for one year in in Chile, in South America. And after that, one year in Brazil. um, Mm -hmm. And so kind of been all over. And after that, um, while um, while I was in Brazil, I you know, I, I studied there and it was a really, really beautiful experience. And from there, I, I decided, okay, well, after, after I finished my studies, okay, I, I want to be a writer. I want to be an artist. I, I want to be all these things. And where do all the writers and artists go? And I thought, oh, New York. And then I started thinking, hey, well, what, where do all the artists and writers want to go who live in New York? Mm-hmm. And I thought, Paris. So what? I was like, I'll just skip New York and go to Paris. Yes, good. <laughs> Yes. So you ended up in Paris. How long have you lived there? And then I wanted to know about your personal story about how you got started with writing and your artwork and the the documentary that you're doing. So I moved to Paris about, I want to say nine years ago now. Oh, so I've gosh. lived here for nine years. Um, I've also, I've traveled everywhere. I I've done a bunch of art residencies in different countries in Europe and shown my work internationally. Uh-huh. Um, but how did I get here? Well, um, well, as far as being an artist, I have always been an artist. Um, my mom said as soon as I could hold a pencil or paintbrush, I was always creating. Mm-hmm. So there's that. That's always been in me. Um, but when I was around a teenager, uh-huh. um, you know, this moment where our bodies are changing and, and mm-hmm. things are growing, things are not growing, things like that. Well, mm-hmm. um, I ended up escaping into my art because I developed or didn't develop um, one of my breasts. And mm-hmm. it's called a unilateral breast agenesis. And so one breast grew very large and the other one didn't grow at all. And I kept that secret and um, I hid it from everyone. And it was just, I, I lived with a lot of shame and a fear that people would find this, this out about me. Mm-hmm. And I, I ended up escaping into my art and really even creating these worlds and creating these characters and, and living there. And it, I feel like my, my art really saved me. But at one point, it, you know, I was 16 or 15 years old and the doctors weren't going to do anything about it. So I finally had to tell my mom about my breast, uh, unilateral breast agenesis. Uh-huh. And at that point she went to the doctors and talked to them. And, um, I told them I wanted to have a, a breast implant at least to match the other side. Mm-hmm. So when I was 16, I underwent that surgery, um, for kind of a reconstruction of, uh-huh. of the, the side that was missing. Uh-huh. And 
through that after I kept the secret still for a very long time into my 20s. And when I was 24 years old, more or less, I decided to come out about it and just tell everyone. And I did that by painting myself. I painted myself uh, staring at my body in the mirror. Mm-hmm. And I I painted my breasts and they became not breasts anymore, but they were shapes and they were colors. And I got distance from all of that. And I had an exhibition in Paris and told everyone. And and that's um, from there, I, I started creating more and more art about women and women in the digital world. And yeah, that's how it all started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, are you thinking all, one of the things about women in the digital world is how they alter photographs? Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's a lot of topics, but that's definitely one of them, um, altering your image. And it's a lot of it is thinking about too, like thinking about how these alterations or these worlds that we're creating online or these images we create online also influence our real life and who mm. we, what we think about ourselves mm-hmm. in the real world. And I had that idea because I was constantly, I guess, just going, coming back to my breasts, I had this, let's say natural side and then the synthetic side. Yeah. And it was, I was always going in between those two. And I felt, and I think that's what got my interest into these ideas of um, synth- like simulations or mm-hmm. synthetic or simulating something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely changing your image online and, and what that can mean. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting world that we live in right now. It is definitely because the, what, I don't know what the name of that app is where you can, you know, put rabbit ears on your face, on your head. Or, you know, I'm like, I don't get that. I don't, I don't understand. But then I'm 68 years old. So, you know, that's just one of, one of my old lady things, I guess. Although I do teach, uh, you know, I teach at a college. So in a way they they keep me fairly young and up to date, but I wouldn't want to do that to myself, to my photograph, even though, you know, I have sagging skin and, but I just have to accept the aging process and, and be okay with that. But uh, Barry and I have been watching some documentaries about the MCU and all the comic books and the creators and stuff. And one of the things that they were talking about was the female images and what the super women superheroes wear and and all of that kind of stuff and it just made me think of that when you were talking about the digital world and how women are viewed in the digital world yeah i think that's that's the thing um a lot in a lot of ways the internet is just a reflection of our society i think mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. also it's different today though it's more than just a reflection it's almost a funnel because we get lost in it sometimes mm-hmm. but let's stick with the reflection i think the way that we look at so if you look, take the internet and you look at the roles of men and women i think a lot of times women our role is reduced to our bodies and the way we look mm-hmm. and then that means that men's role is completely reduced to their gaze. And so either way is very limiting and not really fun or can get very boring for each mm-hmm. side, I think. Yeah, so, really. Yeah. yeah. So that I think that's the that's something that's interesting about the in the internet. But it's it's true in society. I think women are very much defined by how we look and our bodies and youth and you know, all these all these things that sometimes, I mean, I know I've had to go through my own journey with my body and that's yeah. also why I, I think the way I do, but I just, I've gotten to this point now in my life where I'm like, well, they're just bodies. We're just bodies, right? Like what's right. the big deal? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, I'm, I'm really into spiritual things. And so it's really, we are not our bodies. Our bodies are just a vehicle for us to walk around in the world it's, that's not who we really are. We really are something else unseen. So yeah, you're, oh yeah, I love that. That's right. Yeah. It's just, 
it's just what we were born with. And there's nothing to be ashamed of that. Although it's, that's really difficult mm-hmm. to come Definitely. to. Definitely. Yeah. Because everything around us growing up tells us the opposite. But right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's like, it must be like this for guys too. But for women, it's, we are comparing ourselves to to the images in the advertisements or to the, or to even each other. I remember, you know, being in high school and gym class and we're all showering together and everybody's checking out everybody else's body and, oh my gosh, my body doesn't look that great or whatever. Yeah, definitely. And I think the things like that, it can go to one of two ways. It's either everyone's judging each other and comparing and making fun of each other, Mm -hmm. um, or it could be a more of a safer place where, I mean, I remember there were moments when I was growing up and I saw someone's body and I thought, oh, well, okay, they look like that, you Mm -hmm. know, and it Mm -hmm. it kind of made me, I guess, be more open-minded in a way. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I guess what I have is not that strange because this person has that and they're a normal person. Like, I don't know. Yeah, right. Well, and if you think of somebody like Stephen Hawking's who lived for how many years with ALS and, but he didn't let that stop his intellectual pursuits. You know, he just kept whatever he was really interested in. He just kept pursuing that. So there, and there are examples of that all the, all over the place, you know, someone's got a disability, but that doesn't stop them from running the Boston marathon or, you know, or even, I saw a picture this week of someone in a wheelchair and they were pushing themselves in the wheelchair, uh, but they were in the New York marathon. You know, it was like, wow, that is, that's just so inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Yeah. It's, it's really, no, it's, it's so important. I think for us to have as many diverse bodies and images out there, just so Mm -hmm. it's more normalized too, that it's not so strange or I don't know. I think it's important that we give a lot of attention. I mean, there's two sides. Sometimes you don't want to give too much attention because there's this feeling of a zoo or something. I don't know. I feel like at least with my with my, my personal thing, I I don't want to necessarily be fetishized or something either for it. Mm. But at the same time, I think it's important to talk about it and that more people Mm -hmm. talk about the diversity of their bodies or, Mm -hmm. or anything. Mm -hmm. So, well, I was going to ask you about your YouTube video about that painting that is with the number of the serial number of your breast implant. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah, that one. Um, yeah. So that one is, uh, it's from my void series. I, I decided. So last February, Mm -hmm. um, 2020. Yeah. As time Uh is time, time time is like a a wormhole right now. (laughs) Everything's so crazy. (laughs) Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, February, 2020, I had surgery and it was to take out my breast implant. So the implant that I referred to, um, when I, when I was 16 years old, so 17 years later, uh, doctors told me that it was time to take it out. Uh And they told me that it was that they gave me different options. They said, okay, we could take it out, um, and replace it because they, uh, doctors always want to replace it. And then they also said, we can also remove your right breast and replace it like your, your right, my natural breast. We could uh-huh. also replace your natural breast and then uh, replace it with a, a silicone implant mm-hmm. so that they'll be more similar. And I just thought, oh, I don't want, I didn't even want one implant from right. the beginning. Like it was just, I had to do it. And now I'm going to have to put two and in 10 more years, I'll have to have a surgery. And want to deal with any of this. And so I decided, okay, how can I just not have any more surgeries and completely dedicate myself to art? And I thought, okay, maybe if they can remove my natural breast, they can just remove everything, the implant, the breast, everything. And Mm -hmm. I just won't have to have any more surgeries. So I, it was a very difficult decision because for me, I find a lot of power in my femininity and breasts and I don't know, all those things are so attached to femininity. And uh, I just, 
in the end had to redefine femininity for myself. Mm -hmm. And I had the first surgery last February to remove the implant. So for me, this was a moment where I got to, I guess, confront that lack, that the agenesis, the breast that never grew. And the for the first time in 17 years. And that I guess I in a way I was looking at a hole or a lack or a void. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe that's where my power is. Like there's not very many people who don't who grew up with a, a breast agenesis on one side. Right. So maybe that's somehow my power or my connection to something. Mm -hmm. So I decided, all right, I'm gonna paint that. I'm gonna paint the void. And I want to, in every painting, I want to get closer to it until finally I enter it. So oh. the painting you're talking about, that was when I was kind of, still kind of far from the void. And mm -hmm. when I first removed the implant. Um, and so that's why I named it after the serial number of the implant. Yeah. And then I noticed that there's a painting behind you. Is that another one of the void paintings? Yeah, so that's getting closer to the void. It, this ah. one, <laughs> this one is called en um, "Encounter," because yeah. I guess we're we're encountering the void. Yes. And um, yeah, that one is, is just simply that that I'm almost into the void, and I do have paintings after that as well that I'm starting where I'm inside the void. So now I'm at the stage of what's inside there, and mm -hmm. you know what what universe exists in there. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I love yeah. that. <laughs> I I don't know. I just love. I mean, I try to go to the void through meditation, but I don't know. Painting it that sounds. I just love it. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's so creative. And also, I mean, I'm a writer too, and so for me, sometimes I have to sit down and write something to figure out what I'm feeling and thinking about. It, you know, because mm -hmm. <laughs> lately I've, I'm, I have been confronted with some things that happened when I was in college. I didn't go to college until I was 22. So it was, it was around when I was 24. Also, when I had this, uh, I had changed my major from music to religious studies. And I was at this really small Christian college and I kept getting con confronted by these Bible thumping guys say, you know, quoting to me the Bible and that I needed to change my major because I was the only woman in the program. And, wow. um, and that, you know, it wasn't a large amount of people that maybe 15 of us, you know, <laughs> but a lot of times I was the only woman in the class. And so it was interest. That was really interesting, but some things have happened recently that just brought up more stuff. I thought I had dealt with all my anger and rage about that, about being told because I was a woman, I couldn't do something. And so the other day it came to me, oh, I just need to write a blog post about that, about all the little things that have come up that have made me go, you know, I'm really tired of mansplaining. I'm really tired <laughs> of, you know, a man not believing me because I'm a woman, or I have a couple of students who are men in a class and and sometimes it's like oh well you're you're a woman teacher and we don't have to turn in the stuff when we're supposed to turn it Aww. in you know I mean, I mean that's my maybe not really there where they're coming from but that's what I feel like you know mm -hmm. so yeah painting it or writing it is I think a really great way to figure stuff out Definitely. I think that that's a, a phenomenal way to figure things out. I'm, I think every, every artist or every creative person should, should write. I think it's a tool that we have. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. if, you know, we're, most of us are lucky enough to be educated in, in reading and writing, even, you know, at the basic level. And so just using that to discover ourselves and our ideas is so important. And um, going back to what you were saying too, about not being believed as a woman and uh, even maybe not respected as much as a woman. It's, it's sad because I, I feel like that's exactly the world that I and my friends also still live in today. And it is mm -hmm. true that there is a different respect for a, a male professor versus a, you know, a woman professor. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, of course I'm speaking generally and um, of mm -hmm. course there's exceptions, but 
it it's it's not easy. And even in these STEM classes in math, biology, mm-hmm. I remember what those what it was like to be very good at those subjects and having to prove myself constantly because no one wanted to be in my group because they thought I was stupid because I was a woman. No one ever wanted to do group work with me. And or they would speak speak down to me all the time. And oh. I know that those are that's what happens to women in school. I and know. it's those little things that build up and accumulate that make you choose between, okay, do I want to live a life where I'm constantly fighting inside in this field with my colleagues, with my team members, or will I change field? Right. And the women who, pers- who, who persevere, I mean, it doesn't matter what they, because uh, I haven't read it, but my sister read Hillary Clinton's autobiography. And she said, oh my gosh, some of the stuff she had to deal with. And she just kept being persistent, persistent, persistent. And I don't know, at 68, I'm getting kind of tired of being persistent. (laughs) 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 Even sometimes I get angry with my husband over really stupid little things. But, you know, I realized, oh, he, it's just a reflection of the things that I need to, to heal. Mm-hmm. Because if I heal an attitude about something or someone, then I- I've discovered they treat me differently. There is a lot of self-work, I think, mm-hmm. that goes into to all of it. And But yeah, I do still think that we do live in <laughs> oh, a society yeah. that yeah. is not helpful or easy to yeah. the to women. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I do think that we... There, of course, there are a lot of great people out there who try as well, and we are cha- we are moving forward. I mean, look how open we are to speak about these things now, mm-hmm. and it's almost you know trendy at this point. So mm-hmm. that's really exciting and cool. Yes, yeah. really, that is that is exciting and cool. So maybe I'm not quite ready to give up yet, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't give up. Don't ever give up. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's right. That's don't give up. <laughs> um, so now I didn't actually do a lot of research about what you're doing with your documentary, but I wanted to know about that. Are you still working on that? Yeah. So that's a, it's a long-term project. It's um, the title is La Ladrona Agenesis. Oh. And it's about, I decided to make a documentary about my agenesis, my breast agenesis experience Uh and to talk about what it was like when I was young and uh, also going through the surgeries. I was working with a filmmaker and they even, uh, you know, they filmed the surgeries. They were in the the Uh operating room and everything. Uh So there it's a long-term project because I still have that last surgery. I I think I'll have it at the end of uh, 2022. Mm-hmm. And so it's this full journey. And the reason I wanted to make it is because I've never, ever met anybody else in my life uh, who has had a unilateral breast agenesis, but I know that they exist um, yes. because people have told me, oh, yeah, I know somebody like that. I know I had a, an ex-girlfriend like that or um, mm-hmm. but I, I believe that we are born Amazons. So, you know, the animal Amazons, they're the right. Um, yeah. They, they cut off their, their breasts. Uh, they're the warriors who cut off the, one of their breasts so that they can pull their arrow a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess people with unilateral breast agenesis, they were just born without one of their breasts. So they were already born warriors. Right. And I just think it would be amazing to meet one person just because it's a, there's, I think that when you can, when you meet one person who's had a similar experience to you, it can make you feel a lot better and it could be very healing in a way. So. Yes, really. Oh yes. I think that's so important. I love that. I love that idea of your, a born Amazon. I just I think <laughs> that's because it, that's an empowering way to think of it. Oh gosh. When I was a teenager, I thought I was fat and ugly, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. because my mom and, and I'm not dissing my mom, but she was born in the depression and she has told us stories of she and her sister would come home from 
school and they would stop off at the grocery store in their little town and they would each buy a potato and they would go home and cook it and they would eat that. And sometimes that would be their dinner. And they didn't have a lot of, you know, great nutrition when they were growing up because their family, you know, their mom and dad didn't have a whole lot of money. And so she was 95 pounds, I think, or 98 pounds when she got married. She was 18. Wow. And so she used to say to me, oh, you're so much bigger than I was. You're so much bigger <sighs> than I And it's like, oh, I must be fat. You know, I mean, uh, that's how I took it. I must be fat. Well, yeah. I look back at those pictures. Oh, my gosh. I was just, you know, telling myself a story that wasn't true. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I think we do that to ourselves. Everybody does that to themselves. And so any way that you can find to feel good about yourself that is healthy, I think is great. And I mm-hmm. love that you think of yourself as an Amazon. Yeah, I think it's a, a very empowering way to go about it. I actually, I didn't even, to be honest, I didn't even know about the Amazons or maybe mm-hmm. I'd heard about them and I didn't make the connection. I don't know. Until I was about, I think, 23 years old and I came to Paris and one of my mentors, he, I, I told him about the breast, unilateral breast agenesis and he told me, oh yeah, you're like an Amazon. And I said, it was the first time it clicked for me. Like, oh wow, I'm like an Amazon. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, really? Oh wow. Yeah. So I think we sometimes, I don't know, it's, it's strange when things come into your life, but you, you realize things. Um, and, and yeah, and coming back to, to mothers, I think that's another thing. I think mothers, they, a lot of times they just want to protect you and they want the best for you. And Mm -hmm. sadly, you know, again, coming back to in a world where women are defined by their bodies, Mm -hmm. they just want us to have an easier life, you know, and which is really sad Mm -hmm. to say to say it like that, but, um, I think it comes from good intentions, but it's hard. And, and I mean, that's not necessarily what you were saying. You were saying that maybe you misinterpreted it in a different way. And I guess in a way, also mothers, they see us as an extension of them sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's, Mm -hmm. it's like, wow, you're changing. It's like, Mm -hmm. That means that I'm getting older too. You know, right. <laughs> I don't know. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I mean, on the other hand, my mother worked outside the home. I mean, there were times when she didn't because uh, when I was 10, she had my, my, I have a brother that's two years younger than me, but when I was 10, she had the older of my two younger sisters. And then when I was 13, she had the the her final child my youngest sister and so she didn't work during outside the home during those years but when i was you know even before i went to school she was working outside the home because my dad was a machinist and sometimes he would get laid off of work and so it was always good to have two the two incomes and something to to fall back on if dad got laid off for a short amount of time you know And, you know, uh, all the other kids around me, their moms stayed home. This is in the early 60s, late Mm -hmm. 50s, early 60s. So in another way, my mom was this really great role model, too, you know, because she was working. Well, I mean, I think even back then, she probably probably received a few, you know, comments. I don't know. I imagine back then if you were working, uh, you might get a comment from a neighbor or something, or Mm -hmm. someone might say, well, you know, maybe if you stay home with your kids or, Mm -hmm. you know, well, she never spoke about that That's Uh, because most of the people, the women that she associated with, except for at church Mm -hmm. were working. They were the women she worked with, you know, yeah, I don't know. She never spoke yeah. about that. Maybe she did get that and she just yeah. never said anything about it. Yeah. Or maybe she, who knows if she didn't, because she just didn't care either yeah. and didn't listen. You know, yeah. she's like, that not my true. problem. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Which is right. a great way to go about it. So I am going to put your website up and on the show notes because you can click and see a lot of your artwork there. And also the video that I spoke of on YouTube. Do you have any other videos on YouTube? Yeah. So I have, which one did you, did you watch again? Um, It was the the first, I think it might've been the first painting. 
It was okay, the one so, that was the, the titled the serial number of your breast implant. Yeah. So I have a, a project called retrospectives and this is, that's the video you watched. It's, I'm just explaining my, yeah. um, the inspiration behind my paintings and, you know, kind of analyzing them. And I, but I also do video art. So on my YouTube, you'll find my video art. There's a few short films and then there's some uh, kind of improv poetry oh. um, kind of uh, performance, kind mm -hmm. of very close to the camera um, on my face that are kind of funny, kind of dark, kind of uh, interesting. So yeah, definitely. If you, if you have a moment, check those out. Those are fun. Yeah. Now it's La Ladrona and that's, that's the title of your YouTube channel, right? Yeah. So on YouTube, it's La Ladrona, but the best way to keep up is on my Instagram and that's a oh. Drona at Drona Lala. So do you plan on staying in Paris? Yeah. I, Paris for me is home at this point. I, I love mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It's of course, things are harder just because of our context now with the pandemic, but that's oh, everywhere. Yes. Uh, but I do really love Paris and the amount of museums and art and oh, cultural God. things to do and poetry nights and I don't know, so many things and here. Theater it's, and, and theater, yeah. Um, stand up, anything you want. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we were in Paris for four, I uh, wish we'd stayed longer, for four days. In 1996, when we took a trip circumnavigating the globe, and it, I thought it was such an interesting city. And we did go to museums, and unfortunately, we paid for our tickets at the Louvre, and then they went on strike. And so you could only go Aww. see certain things. <laughs> Right after we paid for our tickets. So all the workers went on strike. So we can only, go see, we can only <laughs> see certain things in the loop. But we went to the Musée d'Orsay and some other museums. And I just, I did think it was a just a beautiful city with the river and the, yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I, when I first got here, I didn't like it at all. I, well, it was just really a, a big culture shock for me. It was, mm -hmm. I had lived in a lot of different cities and a lot of different places, but Paris is very metropolitan. It's loud. There's lots of cars and people mm -hmm. and small streets. So you just, you encounter a lot. And, it, you know, coming from Colorado where it's 360 right. days of sun and here it's overcast, uh, you know, half of the year. Oh yeah. So that was a big you know, change for me as well. And so I saw Paris as a gray city and a lot of other Parisians as well. They, they see it as a gray city. And I think that's also what inspired, I had, let's say a gray period of oh, my painting. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that was after I got to Paris, I painted only in gray, in gray scale. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I was inspired by that. About the web by the weather. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the buildings. Well, yeah. <laughs> Everything. I, I grew up in the, Pacific Northwest and on the Western side, it's, it was like that. It's gray a lot. Well, since climate change is happening, it's not quite like that now, but it was gray a lot. And then, but on the Eastern side, it was like Colorado it was sunny. And now we live in Arizona, which it's sunny almost all the time. Okay. Um, yeah. I went to, I mean, Arizona is, you know, it's a beautiful, it's got beautiful landscapes. I visited Arizona and I went to Sedona. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> it yeah. was it was it was really cool. Um, and I had my tarot reading for the first time, and mm -hmm. I wrote I wrote an article about it. If you want, I'll send you the the article. It it takes place in a fictional. It's like a fictional but based on reality type of story. But oh, I love it's... it. Yes, that would be fun. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that you get lots of sales and attention for your artwork. Although you said that you have had some international exhibits. Do you have mm -hmm. anything going right now? No, right now I'm just working on my next uh, exhibition. So right now I'm just, mm. I'm working on the the paintings that are going to be in it. Um, oh. Very early stages, but um, right now I'm conceptualizing everything and, and getting it all together. Mm. But yeah, but definitely probably in a year or less, I'll probably have another exhibition. Oh, that's cool. And will it be in Paris? Yeah. So this time it'll be in Paris. Oh, wow. I have to go back to Paris just to see your exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because we didn't spend enough time in 
Paris. And we, we, oh, when, when Notre Dame burned, it was like, oh, because that was a very profound experience for me going yeah. into, because yes. the choir was singing and I bawled when I saw the um, sculpture of Joan of Arc. I just wept. Oh, wow. It was so There's, beautiful. I, I don't know what it is about Notre Dame either, but like, I feel the same. There's something about it that feels mm-hmm. very spiritual and, mm-hmm. and I don't know what it is either, but there is something, it might be how massive it is on the inside, but there are other churches that are very, you know, that have high ceilings as well. And I just, I don't feel yeah. the same. There's, there's something special about it. And I, I don't know what it is either. Yeah. Cause but, we went to Saint Denis and it is, it's spectacular, mm-hmm. but it wasn't, I wish we had gone up to a chart. Yeah. There's also Orléans, like Orleans. Oh, right. Which, that's where Joan of Arc lived. Oh, right. Or I think, yeah. I think, or, or or was she killed there? I don't know. No, one, one or the I, other. Yeah. And I, we didn't travel around France and I wish we had now because yeah. we did do a little bit in England. We did do a little bit of traveling around, but we were on our way to Greece. Yeah. And so we decided to take a few days and spend in Paris. Yeah. Well, I guess you, if you're coming to France, it's, it's important to go to Paris just because it's, yeah. you know. Well, there are so many beautiful places though, I'm sure in yeah. France that I've seen photographs of and stuff. And it's like, oh, whoa, we should, we should go there. But Greece, well, that was another. Yeah. I still have more traveling I, I need to do. And then again, I think about the, the context we're into it. May, I mean, we're able to travel, but it just makes it seem more, yeah. I don't know. We're more hesitant to do it. Yes. Oh my gosh. I am just so excited. I can't wait to hear more and find out when your documentary is going to come out and to see more of your artwork, because I like the grayscale artwork. I I think it's really fascinating. Oh, okay. What, What do you like about it? Well, I watch a lot of black and white movies. So in a way, it sort of reminds me of that. I know I, I teach a class called Dramatic Structure. My Sometimes my students are like, oh, we have to watch these black and white movies. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the lighting a lot of times is so interesting. And, and sometimes I just like to sit and go, I wonder what color that dress is. I bet it's red or maybe it's blue. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it's sort of like I get to use my imagination more with it than with mm-hmm. color. Uh, not that I don't, I like color too, but, but I don't know. My husband's a, well, he mostly, he loves pottery, but we have a lot of his visual art around and some of it's, you know, it's pencil, pencil drawings. Mm-hmm. And there's, I don't know, there's something about it that is, I don't know, it feels deeper somehow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I know what you're talking about. I think um, when something's monochrome, so like just one color, mm-hmm. and that could be just black and white, or it could be red, especially black and white. It it's calming, and it it mm-hmm. lets you, as you were saying, it lets you concentrate on other things. So maybe a painting or an image with a let's say a lot of objects in it, and if it's a lot of colors and a lot of objects, maybe it's too much, and you won't look at it for very long because it's just too much. So you right. look away. Yeah. But if it if it was a lot of objects in black and white, you might stay a little bit longer. You might mm-hmm. look at it. I don't know. It doesn't hurt your eyes necessarily. Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of more inviting. Oh, okay. Something you said made me realize kind of what it is about that. I'm a highly sensitive, empathetic person. So sometimes, like some of the superhero movies, uh, you know, some people, the reviews say, oh, there's not enough action. I'm sorry. There's too much. Action. Too much. I agree. <laughs> too much. I don't like, honestly, like, I don't like those movies. There's too much action and not enough story. Like if they just went a little deeper uh-huh. into characters and went a little deeper, but instead they want to have 15 characters that are all crazy. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of action. And then yeah. you're like, wait, I don't remember anything that happened. Yeah, well, some of well, some of them are like that, and then others are where I love that they give you little. Well, I've been studying film for a long time, not formally, but my father used to question us. You know, okay, so what did you think of the film? Well, I like the characters. Well, what did you like about the characters, and so on and so forth. I mean, we just keep talking about it like that until we got down to the 
nitty gritty of what the purpose of the piece was, you know? And so I notice things like, oh, there's, here's a line that's giving you an indication about what that character is really feeling. It's, you know, and it could just run, if you're not paying attention, it just goes over your head. But I pay attention to every line, every facial expression and body language and all that to be, to look for the clues. And part of it has to do with my theater background, because, you know, that's, how actors convey their, you know, what's going on with them. But yeah, Mm -hmm. a lot, I think you're right. Some of the, some of them, even the ones that I like have way too much action for me. And, you know, I just sort of tolerate that part. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, one time my husband and I said, okay, how many times can you destroy New York? You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think it's also, I mean, speaking from, you know, a film perspective too, and even looking at camera angles and things like that, I've also noticed if the camera isn't following a character through mm-hmm. their experience, like sometimes, for example, you can have somebody waking up from, I don't know, passing out and, you know, the camera will be close to them and it's kind of fuzzy and they're waking up and I love that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And then after that, they get up and it really follows the character mm-hmm. in those superhero movies. It's never like that. It's always mm-hmm. from a distance. You see them. So you're very distant right. from these character mm-hmm. and always a spectator watching. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think I like something more immersive too. Yeah. Something that's more intimate. I like, I think that's one of the things that I really love about some of the more classic movies because they do that. It's like the camera is a voyeur in a way, but it's our way of looking, seeing into the character. And there's this, there's one that I always show it in dramatic structure class. And it's a Betty Davis movie called Now Voyager, where she's in in her thirties, but her mother had her when she was older, like she was approaching menopause when she had her daughter and she was the only daughter. So the daughter's supposed to take care of the mom. Well, mother's very controlling. And uh, so she's goes on, but she goes on this journey of self-discovery. And one of the things that is so interesting about that movie, and I didn't realize it until like after the 20, 20th time I'd seen the movie, the camera show, the first time you see Betty Davis, you don't see her face. You see her feet coming down the stairs and she's wearing these lace up the top, really like industrial strength shoes. And then there's another shot later on as she is emerging as a human being and learning to socialize and learning to love herself where her costumes reflect this. And there's another shot where she's coming down the gangplank of this ship and it shows her shoes, very fashionable shoes. So it's like the camera's indicating to you, look at her evolution as a character and the costumes that she wears reflect and her hairstyle reflects it. And so those kind of details, whenever we watch anything I love to watch the special features where they talk about the costumes and why they chose the colors that they did or the settings or the, I just love that because that's what art, that's the art of film, I guess, is showing ways to indicate the characters Mm -hmm. and their changing moods. Definitely. I can see that you're really passionate about film. That's, that's incredible. I love, I love film as well. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you're a filmmaker now, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, definitely. I should probably watch more of of those older films, though. They're always oh. always oh. good. I also just love the you know there was no CGI or anything. They they actually mm-hmm. did. They made special effects, and the creativity it mm-hmm. took to make those special effects in real life was just and it just looks so much yeah. better too. I think it looks yeah. real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's well, great. And, and it's interesting. We were watching something the other day and well, I think it's something on Apple Plus. Oh, it's Foundation. And we were listening to the podcast about Foundation. Foundation is based on some Isaac Asimov books. So this series is based on these science fiction books. But they were talking about how they really didn't want to use CGI for for certain things. They wanted actual practical special effect. Well, they wanted to do things in a practical way rather than have special effects. And that's not the first, those aren't the first filmmakers that I've heard say that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, CGI is great for some things. So they're kind of going back to old school a little bit. Some filmmakers are, which is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yes, I am passionate about, I'm passionate about stories in, in all different kinds of genres. So visual art to me tells stories as well. Yeah, for uh, sure. And I feel like there's always a story behind it, even though I think a lot of, there are a lot of artists, of course, there's different kinds of artists out there. There's artists who want to create art to tell them to spread a message or mm-hmm. to explain an idea. That's me. Um, and then there's artists who are just simply expressing. Um, so mm-hmm. it's in the moment, it's gestural there. It's just a dance um, and that's it. Um, and then I think there's, there's also artists who have a story and they're going to constantly be inspired by that story for the rest of their life. It, the story is so good that they're able to draw inspiration from it forever. Mm-hmm. And I also feel like I probably fall into that category one way or another. Maybe I, I'm not going to be making art about you know breasts my whole life, of course, but right. um, it's going to be stemmed from there. I think a lot about presence and absence because I had the natural breast and then I had no breast. So there's... Right. A lot of, I guess, kind of esoteric or uh, metaphysical, you know, thinking and ideas that come from that experience. I think that I'll forever have inspiration for stories, for for art, for everything. So, yeah, well, it's kind of like we have. I think everybody sort of has a theme, a life theme, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's your maybe your life theme. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I I would love to ask people that. What are, what is your what is your life theme? And some people won't know. Yeah. I mean, there will be people <laughs> who won't won't have a clue. Yeah. But for me, it's of my life theme is learning to love myself. I mean, I think that that's in my opinion the major problem in the world is people mm-hmm. don't love themselves and so when you don't love yourself, you have to judge other people and mm-hmm. uh you know, I mean it's like all the problems are outside of yourself instead of inside of yourself. Um, yeah. You it's know. like how, how RuPaul says, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? <laughs> well, exactly. Oh, oh my gosh. Isn't he great? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't watch his show, but I love what he's doing. I think it's so great because the people that he works with, uh, they, they weep, they, oh my gosh, you know, they mm-hmm. realize oh, what I've done to myself all these years and I can love myself now. And mm-hmm. yeah, that is so important. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think that's the theme of, of his shows forever or, or oh, it's oh, always, yeah. yeah. Love. You got to love yourself, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, yes. it's hard. I think we've, we've been taught to make other people feel more comfortable all the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. We've also been taught to hold ourselves to a, a standard that doesn't exist. Exactly. Oh yeah. my gosh, really? That's so true. Yeah. And it's sort of, you know, it's passed down DNA from generation to generation to generation. And now it feels like we're kind of breaking out of that a little bit, maybe. Yeah, I think so. I think generation by generation, I think, you know, we we've, we've made some big, we've made some big leaps mm-hmm. in the last hundred years. And I think the next generations are going to take it somewhere great if we're if we're lucky keep oh, keep our fingers crossed yeah yes <laughs> really yeah we have a whole bunch of like five or six new nieces and nephews their grand nieces and nephews you know our our siblings are the grandparents you know Barry and I don't have any children so it but so but it's really interesting to watch the the, the evolution of from our generation to our nieces and nephews and then to how they treat their children and the things they teach their children. It's just, I love it. I love watching that whole process, you know, that's powerful. And I never heard felt the click in my head to have a child. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Barry never kind of felt that either. Because while we were on our trip around the world in 1996, we decided because we had been trying to have a child you know, a baby before that. And then we just said, you know, we want to concentrate on other stuff. Partly we want to concentrate on our own growth, but also on our own creative endeavors. And, and, 
you know, when you have children, they come first. Yeah. I, and it kind of should in a way be like that, you know, it so. should be exactly. It should be. Yeah. But, you know, being 10 and 13 years older than my younger sisters, I took care of them a lot. <laughs> And I, you know, I had to wait to do my homework until they went to bed, you know, wow. I was taking care of them because uh, my mom and dad did a lot of church work. And so, you know, they'd be gone in the evenings. You know, I put my sisters to bed and, you know, I'll make sure they had their baths and blah, blah, blah. And so, yeah, it just, it takes so much effort. Yeah. And if you, if you have a child and you're not willing to put in the effort, that's mm-hmm. not good. Yeah. Or like, I think it's also very wise though. I think some people don't go, don't go through the, you know, the, the process of thinking about all of that too, about what they're going to be giving up if they have kids. And, Mm -hmm. and so they just jump into it and then feel maybe bitter or, you know, didn't know what they were getting into necessarily. And of course there's people who are also very, very happy, but I'm also one of those people who I will not have kids. I think I've there's just too many other things I want to concentrate on. I've spent right. my ent- entire life. I feel like this, this breast or this breast implant has sort of been my baby and I've carried it around for 17 years and finally got rid of it. There's no way I'm going to grow something else in my body right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. Yeah. And then on top of it, it's, um, uh, I just want to dedicate myself to my art that those are my mm-hmm. creations. And I would love to inspire the next generation and, mm-hmm. you know, be a role model, um, as a, a strong woman artist. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think that's, that's enough for me. If, if I could even touch on a little bit of that, I would, it would be great. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I was talking to, um, uh, the episode that just aired yesterday, I was talking to Ivan Bodley and he's a, a bass player, a, a professional, And, you know, he's one of those people that's, he's sort of in the background of the bands that he plays with, but, you know, he was saying when you choose to do the art, that's important. And even if you're only playing at a nightclub with 30 people in the middle of the night, that's important because you're, you're speaking to them in an emotion because music's so emotional, you're affecting them in an emotional way. And that to me is what art is in all its forms. Mm -hmm. It's, it's speak because I have had some profound experiences when I've gone to the theater and seen a play that just was like, Oh, Whoa, that's a totally new perspective. I never thought of that before. Or I, when we went to see the Van Gogh Museum, oh my gosh, I was in the Van Gogh Museum and the, his paintings affected me this way too, but we were on the main floor to start with. And I came around the corner and there's just this little picture of a bedroom or something. And it was like the energy shot off that painting. And I started to cry and I went, whoa, okay, who painted that? It was a Picasso. Hmm. It was like his energy was still in that painting. The Van Gogh paintings were like that. They had this gentle, loving energy. And my favorite ones were the ones of just people harvesting the wheat. Not the real super famous ones because they weren't even in the museum. But those were just, oh, I loved them. And they're are artists even, you know, here that just have this, the energy of the paintings or the energy of the glass work or whatever it is they do is so, it touches me in ways Mm -hmm. that, and, and you never know, I never know, I never know which paintings or which piece of art or which movie or even, even news stories sometimes are going to, make me weep or touch me in a certain way. Like all the women uh, Emma Watson has been gathering about climate change this last couple of weeks. And I see some of those videos and I just start to weep. It's like these powerful young women. It's so great. It is. It's, it's hugely inspiring. It is. Yeah. So I went off on a tangent there. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, it's okay. I think it's, they're all important and and beautiful topics. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Oh my gosh, it was fun.
Yeah, of course. It was fun. Thank you so much for, for taking the time and, you know, having me on your podcast. It's, it's a pleasure and it was great meeting you and, and really great chatting with you as well. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and give us a review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. You'll find the show notes for this episode at my website, Sage Woman Chronicles at sagewoman.life. You can leave a comment there. And remember, as Philip Pullman said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.